Dr. Gershaw basically just summed up my entire lecture. He said, I like to do things. When Christ stood in the synagogue in the company of the elders of Israel during a time of great apostasy, corruption, sloth, and complacency, he declared himself as the liberating Messiah. But this was not simply a declaration of local liberation as in the days of Israel. This was a declaration which focused upon the entire global order, which would be inaugurated and accomplished by the sending of the Spirit at Pentecost, empowering God's people for the reconstruction and the reorientation of the entire culture Godward. According from Isaiah, Isaiah told them this, anticipating the Christ and what he would do. Isaiah says the Spirit of the Lord God, the Christ here is speaking, and this is what he declared when he stood in the synagogue, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. You see, this was to be the beautiful accomplishment prophesied from before the foundation of the earth, once Messiah entered into the realm of history. But then Isaiah adds this, so as to stress exactly what these redeemed individuals were to do, were to accomplish as a result of such a messianic liberation at the time when Christ came and at the time when Christ empowered his people at Pentecost. So Isaiah adds this in verse 4 of Isaiah 61, he says, And they, speaking of the church of Jesus Christ, speaking of you and me, and all those who are truly the Christ's people, he says this, and they shall build the old wastes. They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. You see, this was God's divine call to change the world. No longer a local declaration to change Israel or even to change Canaan. But this was now a global declaration to change universally, not only the world, but everything in the world. Every institution, every family, every church, everything. It was a comprehensive call to change the world by the power of Christ's grace upon his people. Again, Milton Gaither in his work, Homeschool in American History, he observes homeschooling has come a long way since the late 1970s when any discussion of it could ignite impassioned debate by just suggesting the idea. One could go on for many pages listing the achievements of homeschooled children and adding to the list of notable choosing this route those notables choosing that route of homeschooling, which was very difficult to do at that time. He continues, if there is a theme uniting the trends, personalities, and various movements of homeschooling, it is the steady move of homeschooling from the fringes to the mainstream of American life. But you see, Gaither goes on to identify a problem, and I concur with his analysis. And that analysis is best given by Homeschool Legal Defense League's Chris Klicka in 2006 when he warned that God would only continue to bless the homeschool movement as long as it kept Christ first and foremost. Notice, the thrust was a Christocentric educational model with Christ as the center. But it seems now as if this warning by the late Dr. Clicker, has gone unnoticed. Like Israel during the days of the judges who had forgotten God, those who neglected God, many within the homeschool community have forgotten the reason, the fundamental, central reason, 
for a Christocentric education strategy, and they have, like Israel, they have traded it for a secular goal, and they have adopted a secular blueprint. So what we have now in the homeschool community is a synthesis of Christian ideas, Christian focus, Christian purpose, along with pagan ideas, pagan focus, and pagan purpose. Gaither adds this, he says, Christian homeschoolers are thrilled, notice, they're thrilled that the public accepts this homeschooling. They're thrilled at the public acceptance of homeschooling and they celebrate the high test scores, college admission rates, and other markers of quote unquote worldly success achieved by so many homeschoolers. Gaither identifies this as a paradigm shift, a fundamental shift from Christocentric home education to a pseudo-religious, almost worldly, and even pagan-based education system, which is simply secular schooling structured in the home. Taking what the state has taught us and brought it right into the home under the thought that we are now educating our children for Christ. And he calls this the hybridization of the movement. In other words, there are now, in the home education movement, that homeschooling movement, there are now aspects of it which are indistinguishable from the pagan system. Indistinguishable lines between the city of God and the city of man, between the children of light and the children of darkness, they are now indistinguishable. What they have is a, a cloak of religiosity, but for the most part, the power thereof has been denied. And once this happens, once this synthesis happens, once this syncretization, this syncretization happens, Christian homeschooling can no longer be called Christian education. And just because a parent chooses to homeschooled child within the confines and in the protection of the family, it does not automatically make it Christian education. If education is not explicitly Christ-centered and purposely kingdom-oriented, with its training and discipleship rooted in God's Word, it is transformed into something else, it is hijacked into something deformed, perverted, indistinguishable from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Once this happens, it becomes devoid of its original intent, which is to reorient the culture Godward because it is devoid of power and it is devoid of God's blessings. Once you water down the commandments of God and replace those commandments with the words of men, Christianity becomes devoid of power and no longer will God bless you. R.J. Rush to me observes, he says, the sovereignty of God in education requires us to reorganize all education in terms of biblical faith and presuppositions, to assert the crown rights of King Jesus in every area of life and thought, and to yield unto our Lord His due obedience in church, state, school, home, vocation, and in all of life. Without the synthesis. He continues, he says, nothing short of this is Christian. The doctrine of God's sovereignty requires it. Thank you. you see, what the Christian parent needs to understand, first and foremost, is that God, not the state, owns the children. And it is He, and He alone, by virtue of His majesty and His sovereignty, it is He and He alone who dictates not only how a child is to be educated, but to what end that child must be educated. To what end? In other words, what is the end of education? And the end of Christian education, Christocentric education, is not simply academic knowledge or academic ascendancy, but it is kingdom action. That is why you educate. So that we can take that cultural mandate and make it into something real, tangible. 
Christian parents also need to understand that the statist education is actually a form of Moloch worship which is strictly forbidden by the scriptures. And as we have already determined, it is a system based upon Baalism and the ideology of Ashtaroth which not only perpetuates wickedness, but it impedes any action for Christian dominion. So the more you bring the state and the secular system into your home, it is not only bringing wickedness into your home, into the confines and the protection of your family, but it is also impeding that Christian influence in the culture. It stops, dead cold, that dominion mandate. Rush Dooney informs us that, quote, the very reason for the establishment of state schools has been, since the days of Horace Mann, the control of man by the state. The kingship of Christ is replaced by the kingship of man. He continues and warns us that under the influence of Neoplatonic and Manichaeanistic ideas, the church has in recent years withdrawn from the world, withdrawn from education, politics, science, the arts, and in all things else, it has thereby denied, in effect, it has thereby denied the lordship of Christ. End quote. And again, as Gary North has consistently over and over and over declared, he says, you cannot beat something with nothing. So what the Christian community needs is both a strategic goal, which is in conformity with the word of God, and a tactical blueprint in order to get there. Concrete tactics, coupled with a detailed blueprint, are the keys to advancing the Christian culture. And it is the key to achieving any measurable success for kingdom advancement. And you cannot master what you cannot measure. You cannot master what you cannot measure. The success of kingdom's advancement is determined by its leaders and those that shoulder the work. It's all about doing the work. It's all about building something. It's all about putting your, your feet to the, to, the, to the pavement and your shoulders to the grindstone and getting something done. The difference between the genuine leader and the counterfeit leader is the counterfeit leader will talk incessantly about how bad things are. If I hear someone else tell me how bad things are, my head is going to explode. <laughs> As if I don't know how bad things are. And I will tell you this. If we knew how bad things really were, we'd all be under the table. <laughs> so the difference between the genuine leader and the counterfeit leader is the counterfeit leader will talk incessantly about how bad things are while the genuine leader actually does something about it. Notice, actually does something about it. What we have today and what seems to pass is biblical leadership, which is sometimes, excuse me, but it's laughable. What we have today and what seems to be passing is biblical leadership are those keyboard jockeys who talk and talk and talk and talk, more and more vomitous talk, usually just to hear themselves talk but to show how smart they are, theologically or astute they are, or how cunning they are, or how many people follow them on Facebook, how many friends they have on Facebook. On the other side of the spectrum, you have those that quietly keep to the task at hand, building biblical alternatives to the world's problems and getting into the fiery realm of real life issues. These are those individuals who try and fail, who get up and try and fail again, and get up a third time and try and try until the light breaks through and they finally succeed, even if it's the smallest success, the smallest thing that they can measure as success. And once they begin to see some success, then they proceed to perfect that which they began.
If we do not continue to think about concrete solutions to real life problems, we will be swallowed up by the secularists. Christians must stop talking about the problem and start doing something about it. You know, I wrote this once on Facebook. We need to stop. I want to know what you're doing. I want to know what you're doing. I want to know what you're building. What are you building? What did you come up with? What failures, what successes have you logged it in? Can I learn from your mistakes? Can I learn from your successes? And I put this out on Facebook. I said, I'm tired of all the talk. And somebody wrote back and says, no, I'm going to keep talking. That's what he told me. I'm just going to keep talking because talk is important. It's only important if it results in doing something. Mm -hmm. So personally, I'm sick and tired of talk. So Christians will stop talking about the problem, start doing something about it. And so biblical leadership is about identifying a problem and then solving it by the implementation of a concrete biblical blueprint. It is the actual doing of a thing. Those that actually accomplish a biblical alternative to the secular model in my estimation, and I believe in God's estimation, are the heroes of the faith. They're the true heroes. Joseph Campbell, in his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, explains that a hero isn't a perfect person who always gets things right. A hero was someone who achieved or, or sought to achieve or actually did something beyond the normal range of achievement and who has given his life, the entirety of his existence, to something bigger than himself, something greater than himself, something other than himself. But Christianity, the gospel of self, has pervaded the Christian community because now the gospel is about me, my salvation, my children, my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, and it's all about me. It's me, me, and me. Jesus is going to give me this. He's going to do this for me and that for me and the other thing for me, and the gospel is not about me. It's not about you. It's about Christ. It's about his kingdom, and that's what the gospel is. And if you have any other gospel than that, you do not have the true gospel. Now, in spite of all of life's trials that the hero must go through, those things of his life which are filled with battles, temptations, successes, failures, slanders, betrayals, because that's what a hero's life is all about. In fact, sometimes it seems as if that's all the hero's life is about. But in the face of that, a hero, a biblical hero, a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl of faith is able to overcome those fears, those battles, those temptations, those successes, those failures because of their great determination, the tenacity, the resolve to achieve what they've set their mind to do because they know what they've set their mind to do is greater than themselves because it is an eternal thing. And they gain, and they only gain their successes through the battles that they face. So if you think you're going to build something without going through all of these trials, temptations, slanders, uh, betrayals, and, and, and difficulties, then this lecture is not for you. This conference is not for you. Because the biblical man, woman, boy or girl knows that once he sets himself to do God's will, there will be blowback. Some of the most horrible kinds. So the biblical leader gains their success through the battles that they face, which test and constantly and seemingly consistently test their resolve and tenacity only to result in maturity and their undying quest for the advancement of the kingdom of God. And if that is your undying quest, then you are in the right place. Heroes do not begin as heroes, nor do they see themselves as heroes. Those people that see themselves as heroes, guess what, folks? 
They're liars. They're lying to themselves. They're lying to you. They're not heroes. They're cowards. The real heroes, they don't begin as heroes. They don't see themselves as heroes. They simply become heroes because they see a need and they are determined to fill that need no matter what it takes. No matter what it costs, no matter what it costs them, they see a need and they go and seek to change what needs to be changed in order to fill that need. A biblical leader is fueled by the grace of God, which teaches that individual hunger. And you can't teach hunger. Ask yourself a question. Are you hungry? Are you hungering for, for the, the righteousness of Christ to change those things that you know are so broken and so detrimental to the world? Because you can't teach hunger. Parents, you have to try to teach your child to be hungry. Come on, Johnny, eat. You gotta be hungry, not hungry. I'm telling you to eat. The child will not eat until that child is hungry. And the only way you become hungry is when God takes you and gives you that hunger. So pray for that hunger if you don't have that hunger. But if you have that hunger, then that hunger is enough. You gotta pray for more hunger. You have to be sold out to the gospel of Christ and the advancement of his kingdom. So a biblical leader is fueled by the grace of God, which leads him or her to extreme devotion at the expense of all things temporal. Let me repeat that, at the expense of all things temporal. You give everything that you have, your skill, your, your intellect, your time, your devotion, your, your, your family, your things. You say, here, here, here. If it's going to make a difference, here it is. Extreme devotion. Not in the morning at 7 a.m. when you wake up before you go to work, before you go to school, or before you have your daily chores, you open up the Bible and you read a little devotion. That's not extreme devotion. And just because you've done it for 30 years, and shame on you for doing it for 30 years and not building anything because of it, but that's another thing. That is not devotion. And being obedient to the commandments of God individually or as a family. Oh, that's good, I'm glad, but that's also moralism if it's not fueled by the grace of God. So a biblical leader gets the job done that needs to be done without excuse. Instead of being made a captive to the postmodern godless culture, a biblical leader seeks to transform that culture into the image of Christ and that takes action. It takes the doing of thing. Nancy Percy explains, she says, we must liberate Christianity from all its cultural captivity, unleashing its power to transform the world. Remember what I said last night? We live in a first world country, not a third world country. Therefore, we have things at our disposal. We have opportunities at our disposal which can transform the world. But the one thing that we have, and I believe we have it, is God is with us. And He has called us this day together to make a difference. And that's the one great thing we have. Like Isaiah, the biblical leader recognizes the commission to go and make difference. And he says, here I am, Lord. Here I am, send me. I'm ready. Jesus warns, he says this in Luke 9, 62. He says, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Francis Schaeffer put it this way. He said, Christianity is not merely religious truth, it is total truth. But we're afraid of total truth, aren't we? We don't want to offend anyone. We don't want to, because, you know, Christianity has become something where it's nice, where, you know, we think about Jesus with the long flowing hair and the eyes, nice and wide, cowboy, bull eyes, and with a little smile, a little lamby, you know. That's not Jesus of the scriptures. You know, when I think about the slogan, what would Jesus do? You know, it is not outside of the realm of possibility that he's going to whip us with, with mm -hmm. three-piece three cord. <laughs> we'll whip the Pharisees. 
or come in judgment one day like he did at Sodom and Gomorrah or during the days of Noah or during the days of Jericho and Ai. That is the God of the scriptures. In other words, Christianity deals with the whole of reality because Christ is a sovereign, comprehensive God over the whole of the reality. The Word of God must bear down upon the whole of the created order so as to be a redemptive force, not only for the individual, but for the entire societal order. So we must stop getting bogged down in reading blog posts, Facebook debates, useless podcast pontifications about theological discussions about how many angels can dance on the head of a pen and do something. And the first thing we must do in this process is identify the end goal. We must know what God wants before we can achieve what God wants. Think about what I just asked you. We have to know what God wants. And everyone here is saying, I know. I, I, I know what God wants. Man, I'm a Christian. I read the Bible. I go to church. I listen to the preacher. I know what God wants. Really, do we really, really know what God wants? So what does God want? Well, I can tell you this, as far as education is concerned, he does not want his covenant children in government schools, mm -hmm. justifying their existence there simply because they have a day of prayer around the flagpole or because they can bring a Bible to school. And he doesn't want status school in the homeschool community. That's what God wants, first and foremost. He doesn't want anyone to have some misguided notion that there is a separation between sacred and secular because it's all sacred. Amen. The other thing God does not want is a home education strategy, a curriculum that extends not only a model and a, a paradigm, but a curriculum that extends from K through 12 only to have every biblical world and life principle unravel and ripped from the child when he entered into secular college. Because mm -hmm. that's what's going to happen. In fact, let me correct myself. That's what's happening mm -hmm. while we speak. What he wants, what God wants, is for us to follow Deuteronomy 6 comprehensively throughout every level of learning with the goal of changing the world through action. He also wants us to encourage others to do likewise and to provide an explicitly Christocentric alternative to those that wish to obey God's commandments. And remember, whatever God wants, God commands, and God expects us to obey. Now, if the education of our children is to be blessed, it must be done according to the precepts of God with clear and concrete goals attached to it. Otherwise, if there are not clear and concrete goals, measurable goals attached to it, it will ultimately fail. And so the first thing all faithful Christians must recognize again is that God does not want your children in government schools, nor does he want the philosophical underpinnings of the government schools in the homeschool environment. The second thing that he wants is for all curriculum to be structured according to the scriptures and not according to the secular system of reprobate man. So we need to go back to the drawing board and teach our children while we're on the way, while we're lying down, while they're setting up, while we're in the grocery store, while we're doing the laundry, while we're over here, while we're over there. It's not just lecturing to them. It's a discipleship program. The third thing God wants is for an explicitly Christocentric education to be inculcated, inculcated upon many generations. It's generational. The way you teach your children is the way they'll teach their children. And the way their children will teach their children. And on and on and on. Fourthly, God wants the goal of all education to be biblically directed at every level of the education process, even when it involves trade schools, so as to be applied to the real world for the glory of God and the kingdom's advancement. All right, so what is the goal of education? What exactly is it? You talk about the goal of education. You say, what, what is it? Let's define some of our terms. Let's first talk about what it's not. Sometimes we can clarify what it is by understanding what it's not. So what is the goal of education? Well, let's ask the question, is it simply an academic exercise? Well, no, it's not. Is it 
an intellectual assessment or conception of men and things. No, it's not. Is it something more, something sustainable, something measurable? Well, yes. So what are some of the results that God wants from an explicitly Christian education? Because you need to measure whether or not you are involved in explicitly Christian education. You need to have it measurable. So how can we measure whether or not our children are receiving an explicitly Christian education? Now remember, our fidelity to the Great Commission must be measurable. In 1976, the Reverend de Graff gave this insight. He said this. Every morning, when a child of God wakes up in our world of naked power, in our atmosphere of despair and intellectual nihilism, then he realizes that he has by the grace of God, answers where others only have questions. And he can sing Psalm 3 again. And he will learn at last to stop being so terribly defensive. Then he will begin in the name of the King of Kings, who placed him here in God's world, where he rose from the dead, to posit clear Christian alternatives to the non-answers of the evil one, and he will take the message of the kingdom outside the mothballed chest of the church into the world where it belongs. Notice what he says, the emphasis to posit clear Christian alternatives, to take the message of the kingdom outside of the four-walled ghetto church, he calls it the mothballed chest of the church, into the world because that's where it belongs. In other words, I'm bringing the message of the gospel, which means teaching and then building concrete Christian alternatives according to whatsoever God has commanded. So the goal of a biblically principled education is based upon understanding what the biblical alternatives are to the pagan model and then how to achieve them. And without that application of knowledge, everything devolves into an academic head-scratching exercise. And I'm tired of the academic head-scratching exercises. You know, when I did my... When I did my seminary work, I read a lot of books. I must have read thousands and thousands of words and pages and books and books and books. And at the end of the two and a half years of reading books and books and writing papers and this and the other thing, I realized I didn't read one Rushton book. <laughs> I don't even remember reading one Calvin book. I certainly didn't read much of the Puritans. They knew how to do things. And I realized, I never started a seminary, I never started a college, what I would not do. So it worked out where those two and a half years of graduate work were the most enlightening years of my life. We must begin to think beyond academics. And again, we must think of education beyond getting a good job, getting a good career, personal pension. That does not advance the kingdom of God. Again, those old things good. That's good. You want to get a good job. I think you should have a good job. You need to provide for your family. But if that job does not have its goal, the kingdom advancement, you have a, you have a truncated gospel. You have a truncated idea of what you are all about. The end must be Christ. Not the good job, not the pension, not whatever. It must be Christ. If you can use that job to advance that aspect of the kingdom, that's what you do. God bless you. Do it. So academics, without the application thereof for the glory of God, never amounted to anything. And if Christians were being obedient to the precepts of God in the area of education, there would be no Christians in government schools, and we would already be building a Christian alternative to the secular model, but we have been asleep. Too little, too late. We would already be building an alternative to the secular model, but we're not. Amidst every human realm and institution of the culture, the stamp of Christ would have, if we were doing our duty, the stamp of Christ would be upon the culture. We wouldn't be in the mess that we're in today. 
Not economically, not politically, not culturally, not in the education realm, not in the medical field. We would not be in the mess that we are in today if we were doing what we were called to do in the beginning. So if we were to measure our progress in the fight against state-run education and the tyrannical power of the state over all the institutions of our realm and the actual building of a Christian culture, we must admit that we have miserably failed. But what's so amazing to me is we seem to know what the right thing is, at least intellectually, at least academically. And yet, we haven't been able to defeat the dragon. Author Rob Moore, an Englishman, I've grown to love him. <laughs> He's a man that knows how to do things. He said this, reminiscent of the Puritans, but he said it this way, to know and not to do is not to know. Which means, I don't care what you know. I'm glad you know things. That's good. Show me what you've done with what you know. Those are the people I want to meet. Those are the people that I want to learn from. Those are the people that I want to coordinate my life with. Because they get it. They understand what Christianity really is. And before we contemplate what we are to do, which we will, I promise, so no one rushes the podium like <laughs> I've been threatened. But before we contemplate what we are to do, or even how we are to do it, and why we ought to do it, we must ask the real question, why haven't we done it already? Why, why haven't we done it? We, we know what's got to be done. Why haven't we done it? Well, not to say that everyone here hasn't done something. I'm being overgeneralized. I'm taking an overgeneralized aspect. But, but pretty much, as far as Christendom is, Christendom is concerned, why haven't we done it already? Well, consider, and maybe this will be good for all of us. It was good for me when I contemplated these things. Let's consider several reasons why we are not getting the job done that we are called to do in the field of education, including not just education, but every other field of God's world. Why haven't we been getting the job done? What are some, in other words, what are some of the impediments to our acting in obedience to God's cultural mandate to do something, to build something? Well, first, we have been seduced into thinking that if we think about the problems long enough or complain loudly enough, or discuss the solutions passionately enough on social media, things will magically change. Mm -hmm. yeah. But this mind game is simply a method of what I call precrastination. You've all heard of procrastination? Pre this is the precursor. <laughs> precrastination. Precrastination is the precursor of procrastination. Precrastination is the illusion of the busyness that we create where we convince ourselves that we are getting things ready to do something before we actually start doing something. I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready. I'll begin as soon as I have enough information. I'm getting ready. I'll begin as soon as I get enough help, enough encouragement. I don't have enough time now, but I'm getting ready. I'm going to slide out some time. I don't have enough money, but I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready. And we convince ourselves that we're doing something because we think that, you know, I'm getting ready. But getting ready doesn't mean anything. It just means you're getting ready. I haven't done anything. You know, when I get ready for the Lord's Day, I shave, I shower, get dressed, I'm getting ready. I haven't preached a word yet. I didn't even get in the car yet. But I'm getting ready. I get ready to preach a sermon. I'm getting ready. I don't know my notes. I'm getting ready. I didn't preach it yet. No one knows what I'm about to say. No one's heard what I've been saying because they didn't do it yet. But I'm getting ready. You see, we've convinced ourselves that getting ready is enough. And we're making all of these excuses to do nothing because we've convinced ourselves that we're doing something when we're actually doing nothing. Getting ready, but I'm not quite ready yet. This is the language of precrastination. Now, precrastination, of course, leads to procrastination, 
which is the action of inaction. <laughs> Procrastination is the activity of delay and postponement. Can't do it now, gonna do it later. Mark Twain put it this way, I love this. Never put off till tomorrow what you can do the day after just as well. According to Jerry Steinfeld, no theologian. I'm going to try not to laugh when I read this. Procrastination sounds like this. Doing nothing is not as easy as it looks. You have to be careful because the idea of doing anything which could easily lead to doing something that could cut into your doing nothing and that would force you to have to drop everything. <laughs> To put it another way, I'm going to take care of my procrastination, just you wait and see. So, brothers and sisters, whenever the temptation comes upon you to procrastinate, put it off. <laughs> but there's something else. Something called active procrastination. The activity of actually being a procrastinator. Active procrastination is being busy for the sake of feeling busy while nothing is actually being accomplished. Think about it this way. You've got a pile of paperwork on your desk and you need to clean your desk. So you take the paperwork and you move to the other side of the desk and you feel like you're doing something. You're not procrastinating because you know you've got to immediately take the paper and put it somewhere and you're just moving things back and forth. Seems like you're doing something but you're really accomplishing nothing. Active procrastination. A second possible reason why we have not been able to actually build something substantial to aid in the reconstruction of the culture Godward is due to fearful indecisiveness. You see, we sometimes put off making a decision to do something out of fear. The fear of failure causes us to put off making a decision to act on what we know is right or needful. You see, we're naturally burdened with questions of doubt and fear. What if I start this project, I, I want to do this thing, I want to build this, this thing, and, and I can't accomplish my goal. I'll, I'll be like that man that started the tower, and he couldn't finish it, and then people will you know, be laughing at me. What if I begin and I find it too difficult to finish, where I bit off more than I can chew? What if I don't get financial support? What if no one's interested? What if I don't have the questions answered concerning my project that I can't continue? What if I don't have the skill or the knowledge to advance my vision? What if I build something and no one is interested in it enough to perpetuate it beyond my life? What if people make fun of me? That's a big one. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. What if people slander me? What if people make fun of me? What if, what if I'm criticized by the Christian community on Facebook. What if somebody writes something negative about what I'm trying to do on Facebook? Well, you know, if, if you really were building something, you wouldn't be putting it on Facebook, you'd be building it, so that's another issue. Mm -hmm. What if I'm targeted by a gaggle of keyboard recon wannabes? <laughs> because they're envious that I've finally stopped pre and pro procrastinating and finally decided to do something. You see, the fear of failure, ridicule, or being called an idiot by those who are actually idiots <laughs> can be a major deterrent to building alternative models for the reorientation of the culture of God. Don't let this happen to you. God help us, don't let this happen to you. Be like Nehemiah. And know that you are doing a good work and you will not stoop to any discouragement whatsoever, no matter where it comes from. And there are plenty of those gainsaying masquer gainsayers masquerading as Christians that are just waiting to discourage you, to slander you, to mock you, trying to halt the work of God simply because they haven't thought of it first. But those Sambalats and Tobias are simply envious that you have nerve, that you, puny little you, puny little me, kid from Brooklyn, had the audacity, had the audacity to build something for the kingdom of God. To actually do something, instead of jumping into their swamp pit of theological social, social media debates, we actually did something. That makes him crazy. 
And once you are entangled in their web of deceit, slander, tail-bearing, backbiting, they are in a position to keep you from making the most important decision of your life, which is to actually build something worthwhile for the kingdom of God and the advancement of the crown rights of King Jesus. Who are they? Who is anyone to tell you that you should not do what God has commanded you to do? I am frankly sick and fed up of the gainsayers. And nothing, nothing should stand in our way because God has called us to do a good work. And yet, we are faced with decisions every day. And each decision, no matter how small or how large, causes us to step into that place which we call the unknown. The unknown. If I do this, I don't know really what I'm getting into. And you know what? If you don't know what you're getting into, you're better off. Because it might dissuade you. But still, you need to make a decision. You make a decision every day. You step into your car to go to work, you're stepping into the unknown, but you don't know if you can make it to work. That is the unknown. Moses was called to make a decision when he was commanded to move Israel across the Red Sea into the unknown wilderness. Joshua was called to make a decision when he was told to move Israel into the unknown pagan territory of Canaan and when he was told to take the city of Jericho, which was one of the strongest fortresses in the known world of Canaan at that time. These men and men like them were called to walk into the unknown to make that decision to go into the unknown. And the only way they were able to move into the unknown was because they knew that God was in the unknown. <laughs> and so they decided to trust God. Not rocket science. We're going to trust God. They exercised faith. God says, move into the unknown. God said it, we're going to do it. They stepped into the unknown in faith and they matured and perfected their mission as they went. All because they finally pulled the trigger on that decision to trust God and to do what He has called them to do. Another reason why we have not been able to cast down every imagination and institution of secularism with concrete alternatives is because of piecemeal compliance. Israel was told to totally eradicate the land of Canaan of the Canaanites. But after they received their inheritance, they decided only to partially obey. They would only reconstruct partially the land of Canaan, which led to the adoption of Canaanite culture, ideology, and even their religion. They had already been given their inheritance, so they started to take it easy. They failed to run the race and fight the good fight of faith to the bitter end because they were slothful. Piecemeal compliance is no compliance. In fact, piecemeal obedience is no obedience. It is actually rebellion. The fourth reason why we have failed in our Dominion Commission is because piecemeal obedience always leads to compromise. The Christian community has made a league with the enemy by compromise, especially in the field of education. We're using secular books. We're using, using the paradigm of the state. And this compromise is further supported by pastors. Well, God help me, I'm a pastor. But there are pastors who refuse to call schooling by the Canaanites sin. But until secular education is identified as a debilitating sin, it will continue to destroy Christendom. Okay, so, how do we begin rebuilding the education paradigm, or any paradigm for that matter, with concrete alternatives that can be seen and measured as to their efficacy. Well, we must begin first with the why. We begin first with the why, and we must begin with the why. Once you can answer the why, why should I do what I'm called to do? Why should I begin this work? Why should I build a concrete alternative? Why should I begin stepping into the unknown? Once you answer the why, the what and the how will naturally follow. 
The why is the motivation which leads to faithful productivity and gospel success. The why is our calling unto God. It is what we believe. It is our cause. It is our purpose in life. We do what we do because we love the Lord in response to His love toward us and our covenant obligation to Him. This why should be behind everything we do. If we do anything that does not have Christ and His gospel as the motivating why, it is no longer for the glory of God. Just consider God Himself. God Himself begins with the why. Why did God send the Savior? It was to save and elect people for Himself, to the glorification of His holy name, to the righteous reconstruction of the world as a result of Adam's fall. He accomplishes the why with the what? With the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, the life, crucifixion, death, atonement, resurrection, ascension, and the sending of the Spirit at Pentecost is the how. But he begins with the why. God accomplishes the totality of his covenant plan with the what and the how, but he begins with the why. The why clarified his purpose. The why must clarify our purpose. It must clarify our values and our philosophy of life. The why telegraphs our passion and it is the very essence of our encouragement. It serves as an extremely impressionable starting point. And by sharing the why, why do you believe what you believe? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you building this alternative to the, the broken secularistic models that are out there? Why? Why are you sharing this? So that others can be inspired, not manipulated, but inspired, sharing the vision, calling them to arms, blowing that trumpet, share our passion by sharing why we do things. It also serves as a catalyst for us to continue throughout the many trials and discouragements that will meet us along the way. We remember the why. Why did we do this? We want to glorify God. You have trials, you have slanders, you remember, why am I doing this? I'm not doing this for me. Because I'll share this with you. I don't share this with many. I do it in jest, but you know, often the truth is said in jest. There's not a day that goes by that I have to remember the why. Why am I doing this? Because if I didn't remember the why, I'd be in the Bahamas right now, mm -hmm. drinking margaritas in the tiki bar, wearing my hair long and wearing flip flops. <laughs> Check that, I, I'll never wear flip flops. <laughs> but it's the why. That's why we do this. Why are you sitting here? That's why you're interested in what I have to say, what Martin has to say, what those books outside have to say. So we inspire others. Now our leadership college at New Geneva began with a vision that didn't even have a college in view initially. And I think it's important for me to share what we went through so that you can see that we didn't begin in the way we're ending at this point. Our New Geneva Christian Leadership Academy began, began as a church. In fact, it began as a, the why. We knew why we needed a place of worship. It was so that we could worship God and raise our families in a visible community church setting. Visibility would place us in a conspicuous dominion position where we could have a community impact. The where and the why, we didn't have a clue how we were going to do this. But we knew what we needed to do. We knew the why. Why are you doing this? We, we need it. We need this church for a reason. We didn't know how we are going to do it. We didn't know what we are going to use. We knew that we needed a public venue. We needed community visibility. We had a little bit of money, which really didn't amount to much, but we had, we had two things. We had a vision, and we had determination. Coupled with that vision, that's what we needed. And so, we found an, or, or, and so we found an old 20th century abandoned tractor repair shop that was absolutely trash. Now when I say absolutely trash, you're thinking that it was a little bit in disrepair. You have no idea, I can't even, I wish I had slides, but it was trashed. When we walked into that building, I brought some of my, uh, some of my brethren with me and they all looked around and said, I think the pastor's lost his mind. One man said, I don't see it. Maybe you see it. Another man said, it's going to take a lot of money. And of course, that always bothers me when somebody wants to measure everything by money. It's 
Don't worry about it. God owns the cattle on thousand hills. Amen. And he's got all the money. And if we're going to be here, if we're going to start a church, we'll get the money. We'll get it somehow. God will, God will bring the money. I don't know how, but let's go forward. Let's see if God will open this door. You see, it was perfect. The place was perfect. It was so trash, no one wanted it. No one in their right mind would ever, ever <laughs> think that they should fix it or, or, or purchase it. All they were thinking about is to tear it down. God had already prepared me by giving me expertise in the exhibit design and construction business, which gave me the ability to see beyond what was to what was possible. I looked at the is, and I knew what it ought to be, and then we just had to figure out how to get there. We also had help, and that's important. Team effort is very important. Others who we had with us, they too, at that time, had a mind to work. Others had embraced the vision, they too helped. And so we were eventually able to both purchase the building eventually and to renovate it beyond what I ever hoped it could be. In fact, we told the landlord that we would pour in money to fix it up so that we can worship there, and he still owned it. And we were able to raise enough money to fix it up to the point that we can worship there without owning it. Now that's stepping out into the unknown because he could said, oh, it looks great now, I'm gonna sell it, see ya. And you say, what, well, that was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty crazy for Elijah to go before the, the 450 prophets of Baal and tell them, hey, <laughs> go ahead, call on your God while I mock you. It was pretty nuts too, wasn't it? Sometimes we need a little bit of crazy. Fueled by faith. Seeing what can be done with things that are almost impossible to achieve in by, by human hands. And so we finally purchased the building. And we purchased it and we renovated it. It took us 15 years. Why? He said. Because we didn't use the bank. Mm. See, time was on our side. We didn't want to use the bank. We didn't want to go to the state. We didn't want our, our testimony to be, to be misaligned in any way. But it did take 15 years, but we did it by the grace of God. All our support came from donors, people who, who were experiencing the vision that I gave to them, said, this is what we want to do. We want to, we want to build a, a, a vision here in this small community. And they, they too, they caught the dream, and they were determined to be part of God's plan. If they couldn't do it physically, they did it through their tithes, their offerings, uh, their prayers, their encouragement, their letters, and make no mistake about it. Those letters of encouragement in the face of discouragement were my meat. Mm. So coupled with our own limited finances, blood, sweat, and tears, we accomplished exactly what God had in mind for us at that time. And once we had the concrete model, we were able to use it. And out of that simple building, this tractor repair shop, we were able to operate not only a church, a reformed church in the middle of, of, of antinomian Baptist Mecca. <laughs> People ask me, why didn't you move to Appomattox? I said, I don't have the foggiest idea. I have no idea. Obviously, it's the way God wanted us. So we finally, out of that building, were able to operate not only the church, but a homeschool academy where we taught various enrichment courses to about 50 homeschool ch children every Friday for years for free. We had the tool, it was the building. Now what? Let's build a model. Let's teach them what education really is. And it's funny because I used to have in my class the mothers of the students, high school and middle school, they used to come to me after the class, I never knew that. Because it was all providential. All providential history, that's what I taught. They never knew that because they were all secular educated. Mm -hmm. So we were using already that vision to educate. Well, later on, I was introduced to a friend of mine 2016. I knew him for a while, but then I began having some serious conversations with him. He was the dean of Christ College in Lynchburg, Virginia, and he had a frustration which I certainly could relate to. And that frustration was that there was a disconnect between theology and the application thereof. 
And therefore, if there's a disconnect between theology and the application thereof, that theology is not theology any longer. I don't know what it is, but it's not theology. Because theology, to be true theology, is applicable. And he, he was frustrated because his graduate students had this disconnect between what they were learning academically and how they were going to use it in the real world. And he said, listen, I need, I need your vision. I, 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 need, I need you to help me to restructure the board of directors. And I agree. And yet, before that ever was launched, he decided, because he got another offer somewhere, he's doing wonderfully, he's a, he's a great man, he decided to take a position and sell the college to another denomination. And I went to that denomination, friends of mine, and I said, listen, uh, why don't we start a satellite school, Christ College in Virginia, Yours will be in Georgia, mine will be in Virginia, and we could do some damage. And of course, I was turned down because I wasn't part of that denomination. But being a New Yorker, no problem, I'll do it myself. <laughs> ah, forget about it. Two years later, that college folded. And they started out with $20,000. We started out with Zippo. Because we had the hunger. And we weren't doing it for money. We did it for the glory of Christ. And so, in 2007, we decided to pursue the establishment of a leadership college, where we would teach students how to use their theological knowledge in order to make a significant impact, underline significant impact, in the world by building concrete models for the reorientation of the culture Godward. And what I found was absolutely astounding. Homeschooled students would come to us and they would do their work and then they would give me, and these were graduate students too who had their degrees and who were older gentlemen, and they would write their final dissertation, their final essay or coursework, and one of the requirements was build a model from what you've learned from that course, and no one had the foggiest idea what to say or how to do it. So I kept sending the papers back. I said, I need some real, I want this to be a playbook. I want this to be a tactical playbook so I could take it and then say, oh, oh, look, you could do this. Now go follow it and go do it. And it took training even from these Christian homeschool men, women, boys and girls. I was astonished. And while there was a ton of written material on the theology of theonomy and Christian reconstruction, and even within that material are strategies and tactics and blueprints which could be used. All of the books are out there. How to do it. And yet, not many understood that. Those are the things, when you read them, you're supposed to do them. You're not just to read the book and put it on the shelf and say, look at me, I finished the book, I read it from cover to cover. <laughs> so what? <laughs> you read a book cover to cover, now what? It's like giving someone a toolbox. He's learned every tool in the box. He closes the box and says, I can tell you every tool that's in that box and how it's used. Great. Now go build something with the toolbox. So there's that disconnect, and we have that problem. That is our default, to be academic-minded, not strategically-minded. So what we wanted from our students was to pursue an action based on biblical knowledge. See, once we know why we should do a thing, we should set out to accomplish that thing. And once we have a direction, we should be able to figure out how to do it, and only then can we execute a tactical blueprint for our vision. Now, New Geneva, its flexible learning center, its library, its hope of requiring an art gallery, and a convalescent healthcare center, and any of its future projects, these are not and were never developed so that people would say, ooh, look at what they've done, how nice. Nor was it developed so that you can come and see what we've done and, and enjoy it and be part of it. It's not why we did this. It was to be a blueprint, a real concrete model of what you need to do in your several communities here and there and across the entire United States. It's just a model to be improved upon, to be tailored to your community. That's why we did it. 
All of these were developed as templates, ideas, concrete models for others to establish in their own communities. Believe me, with God's help, believe me, and I'm, I'm telling you the truth. If we could do this, you could do it. So you ask, well, okay, what, what can I do? What is it that I should do? You do whatever is your passion. What is God calling you to do? What do you love? What, what do you want to fix in, in, in the culture? Stop, stop thinking about your passion. You should already know what your passion is. And begin. Begin now. Begin somewhere. Start something. Anything. At least make an attempt at changing the world. As author Rob Moore has so appropriately said, start now, get perfect later. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. This is what you've all been waiting for. Consider some concrete ideas, strategies, and tactics for the future of Christian education. There are four main considerations to be made when developing a plan. Concept, strategy, tactics, blueprint. The concept is the vision, the philosophy, the overall idea, your vision, which reflects your values. Once you have the general idea of what you want to do, whether it's in education or medicine or, or whatever it is, science or art or music, whatever it is, that general idea of what you want to do is your concept. And once you have that concept, at least you know what direction you're going to go into. Our original concept was ecclesiastically fueled, since we wanted a visible presence of commun in the community as a church, so we could be influential in the community. And once we began Geneva, our direction changed. We matured. We, 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 we went with the flow. We had other needs. The children in that academy were growing up. They were older children. I wanted to deal with that aspect of the education. There was a need. Let's see if we can fill the need. Yet Geneva is only what matured out of the establishment of our church. I never envisioned in my wildest dreams to start a college or a flexible learning center or, or, or a theological library. But if we didn't begin somewhere, if we didn't begin with the church, our home education academy or a college at Geneva, it would, not, it would not have sprouted from it. We had to begin somewhere. If we didn't start somewhere, we knew that we would wind up nowhere. If you don't start somewhere, you'll wind up nowhere. As a congregation, we already had established a well-known community presence. As the pastor of the church in that community, I made it my business, and this is a very, very important tactic that you need to begin today. You know, some of you, some of you speakers have already done this, some of you individuals probably too. I made it my business to get familiar with the local governing officials, the sheriff's department, the shop owners, the local community members, the local clergymen. I made it my business to go out of my way to say, here I am. To begin to develop a rapport. A rapport. I didn't say, oh, he's an Anglican, not going there. Or that Roman Catholic priest, oh my goodness, what a nutbag he is, I'm so not going there. No. No. Well, that shop owner that has a, a sign encouraging the Democratic candidate, no. You hold your nose and you go. You build rapport so that people know that you're not out of your mind because you're Christian. Since we already had a Home Educators Academy, we now look beyond the K-12 grade to a higher learning area. We wanted to establish a concrete educational model for undergraduate, graduate, and seminary levels of learning that would challenge the Christian community on how to apply their knowledge to their own communities for the advancement of the kingdom of God. And we've seen what's coming out of the seminaries. So obviously there's something wrong in the seminaries and definitely in the colleges, even the Bible colleges. We live in the shadow of Liberty University and their slogan is changing the world or a building champions for Christ. Where are they since 1972? What? Where are they? If there are so many champions coming out of Liberty University, where in the world are they and what in the world are they doing? I don't see it. There's nothing measurable. Even the city of Lynchburg is probably one of the most liberal cities in Virginia. And Liberty University owns half the city. What's going on? So I knew there was a problem. There was a darkness 
within the realm of what they called light. And we needed to address it with a concrete solution. But an idea, however, doesn't become a reality all by itself. Just because it's a great idea, it doesn't mean it becomes concrete ex nihilo. No idea can take on a life of its own out of nothing. Effort, concerted effort must be put forth so that that idea becomes a reality. The CEO of Behance, Scott Belsky, has it right. Notice what he says. The misconception that great ideas inevitably lead to success has prevailed for too long. Whether you have the perfect solution for an everyday problem or a bold new concept for a creative masterpiece, you must transform vision into reality. Having an idea, he says, is just a small part of the journey, perhaps only 1% of the journey. Now that brings us secondly to the strategy. Now the strategy is the grand design, the direction, the approach toward the accomplishment of your goal. As far as Geneva was concerned, we wanted to construct it upon several layers. We, we, we would build a leadership curriculum, taking the lectures from the best of the best theologians. We would take the cream of the crop from the best theologians, couple them with the best books, tactical books, and then provide each student with mentoring, interaction, so that they would be challenged in the application of their learning and we would make it affordable and tailored to each and every individual according to their several abilities by God's grace. So they would go to college not being conformed to the college, but the college would be conformed to their needs. It would be complete. It would be also a bricks and mortar, not only a correspondence with a video conference room, thousands of microfiche documents by the grace of the Chalcedon Institute, Puritan hard drives, internet access, thousands of hardcover books, 10,000. 10, we still have, I think it's 3,000 books in storage because we don't have any more room. Added to that, we thought that since every college has a coffee shop, and we're spending all our time there, I'm not going to spend three or four dollars for a cappuccino, I'm going to make my own. <laughs> so <laughs> we figured that since every college has a coffee shop, we too should have a coffee shop, and then we'd open it to the public. Not because we want to make money, but because we want to get traffic. Mm -hmm. We want to show them, here's what we have. We're visible, we're accessible, that's critical. And topping it off, we decided to provide a theological bookstore. Since we have a bookstore and a coffee shop, maybe someone would come, go to the library, maybe buy a book, and those were the books that you would never find in a typical Lifeway bookstore. In other words, you'll never find on our bookshelf a Joel Osteen book. <laughs> oh, I know. Once we do that, it's over. So what would you find in our bookstore? And you know, not for anything, you have a big, well, we'll get to that in a minute, but if you have a big living room, you could open up three days a week and say, hey, come on in. Mm -hmm. Got a bookstore here in my living room. So what will you find in our bookstore? Well, you'll find books from R.J. Rushdie, Gary North, Joe Moorcraft, the Mises Institute, Dr. Fugate, Douglas Kelly, Buddy Hansen, Dennis Woods, Don Schazenbach, Sam Blumenfeld, Calvin Edwards, books from the Creation Institute, and many, many more books that you need to read, but unfortunately, not a lot of people in our community want to read those books because they are not very theologically liberal. But I can tell you this, if we did start carrying Joel Osteen's books, we could probably build an extension to the college. <laughs> so that was our strategy. But what about the tactics? Well, the tactics encompass the operational nuts and bolts. These are the details that you have to deal with, the nitty gritty and making it happen. The specifics, what brings you closer to your goal, your organization, and consistency in that project is key. Now each week when we were developing this, and even now, I would set a goal for the week. Then I'd figure out what I needed to do each day to accomplish that goal, and I would stick to the schedule. Now I still do this. Every, every, every morning or evening, Sunday evening, I look at my, my calendar and I say, well, here's what I need to accomplish this week. And I need to do this, 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 and this during the week to accomplish those goals. I figure out what I need to do each day to accomplish my week's goals. Now, whenever God's providence derails my schedule, I just reorganize. 
I don't worry about it because God has me going elsewhere. But I'm at least organized and consistent in building what I know needs to be built that week. And this is how we built Geneva. This is how we did the church. This is how you build whatever you're going to build. And I'm going to give you some ideas in a moment. Now, for Geneva, the biggest hurdle was raising the money to build the inf infrastructure. We then had to figure out how Geneva would sustain itself since we didn't want to rely on donations only because eventually they dry up. We had to make sure we had streamlined websites, set up internet chat rooms for the students. Uh, we, we needed to eventually get all the lectures and books digitized, put them up on the cloud so that with a push of a button, the student had everything that they would need. These things were all part of the tactics. And it all took time, years to accomplish, to get it right. And after that, of course, we needed a blueprint so that we can execute the tactical plan. Now, the blueprint might include what actual tools you would need to execute your tactical plan. In other words, do you need computers? Do you need software program, money, physical help, construction materials, whatever? In other words, you ask, well, these are the things we need. How do we acquire them? What about the people needed to execute the programming, marketing, building the websites, if that's the way you're going to go? How will you market your model once it's built? One thing we did was we got friendly immediately when we moved to Virginia with the local newspaper editor. We had similar interests, so he promised that, as a Christian man, conservative man, he promised that any editorial I wrote to the paper, he would not edit it. Well, <laughs> I created quite a stuff. <laughs> I took advantage of that. Now, one of our interns works for the paper, make sure that sometimes when we're doing any kind of fanfare of any sort, educationally speaking, it gets promoted in the paper. So we strategically put someone, or by God's grace, someone was placed in a strategic position to push the kingdom's advancement. And yet we have to ask certain questions. What steps did we have to take to stock the bookstore? Who will build the bookshelves? How many shelves do we need? What coffee machines do we need? What, what, what are we going to do as far as opening the learning center? What, what day of the week? What about our college? What about our bookstore? What about opening it up to the public? What about help? What about vacuum cleaner? What about a mop? Do we need disinfectants? What about Windex? Who's going to do the windows? These are all the, the nitty gritty things that we have to think about. But it doesn't happen just by planning. It happens by starting it and then figuring out, oh, you know what? We need paper towels. Because your experience is going to dictate what you need. But without starting anything, you have not the experience to know what you need. And the list goes on and on. You get the idea. Now, what about the learning center itself? And this is what all of you can do. What is a flexible learning center? Well, Lance Box has this to say about its construct. He says, quote, typically, flexible learning centers will be run out of private homes or rented facilities and are privately managed partially supported by tithes and offerings of local, local churches, if possible, of course, and partially supported by commercially contracted fees paid by the users of the service. Their target market will be home-based educators. These flexible learning centers would be equipped with a growing biblical Christian research library consisting of physical books and digital books that can be accessed by the flexible learning center computers." End quote. That's the basic idea. So. In addition to these services, books, textbooks for le lending, purchasing of, of a photocopier so that the mothers can come if they don't have a photocopier, they can come to the learning center, they could, they could take out books, they can use the photocopier, they can use the printer, scanners, internet accessibility, the center would be uh, a, a marketplace of mentors, a clearinghouse for teachers that you would then build a, a, a list of teachers, this teacher teaches calculus, this one uh, science, this one biochemistry, and then they would go and they would find out who's on the list and you would, you would be that, that clearinghouse for all of these, these aspects of learning that these moms need. And it would be a hub of, of learning. You could provide mentorship. You could provide various areas of study that are specialized so that the students and the parents can spark, correspond with those teachers. And depending on the place where the center is located, you could offer coffee and snacks. They may be a concession if you're renting a place. But you could do this in your living room. If you have a big living room, make the shelves. 
Well, I don't know because, you know, we have that nice picture that Granny gave us. And I don't want to move it into the other room. Uh, this is about sacrifice. This is not, not about Granny's picture on the wall. Got the room, put in shells, put up a coffee pot, put a shingle on the door, a flag on, 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 on the, uh, the mailbox, and call every homeschooler in the county and say, hey, look what we've got. We're having open house Tuesday night, pizza. Come and see the books that we have. Come and see our service. We want to help you. And you moms that are afraid, for whatever reason, we'll help you. We'll stand alongside. And you moms that don't want your kids in public school, but you have to have them because your, your husband, husband is working five jobs, and you're working five jobs, and you can't, well, you know what? You send your kids here three days a week, and then you become involved in the evenings, and we'll teach you how it works. Because the churches aren't doing it. That's right. When they drop the ball, you pick up the ball because at the end of the day, guess what? If you haven't known this theologically speaking, you're the church. Mm -hmm. It's not that edifice down the street with the steeple. I get teased all the time by my colleagues in the Ministerial Association that we have a tractor repair shop as a church and we don't have a steeple. So I asked them, I said, would it be, would you rather I put a steeple? Would that make you feel better? Yet you're not doing half the things that we're doing. With so much that you have, you should be ashamed of yourself. You see, you have the ability to change the world in the realm of education. You offer these services to parents that know that the schooling system is busted. You market it. You target your audience. You encourage Christian parents to get out of the school system because you are now able to provide an alternative to the school system. And you teach them what it is to disciple their children, to teach them a trade. Uh, one woman here, uh, one of the women here asked me a great question. She said, well, my son wants to go to college, but there's no colleges. I said, well, we're at, we're at ground zero. We are at ground zero. You're right. Are, well, Geneva, well, Geneva can't teach welding. And this woman's son wants to do well. So my advice is, tell your son, and whatever he wants to do, mechanic, body mechanic, auto mechanic, welding, whatever it is, go to the nearest body mechanic shop, the auto body shop, or the mechanic shop, or, or the welder, and say, I'll work for you 20 hours a week for free. You teach me the trade. Mm -hmm. And then, that young man, each other centric from a Christocentric platform. These are all the questions that we have to ask in order to accomplish our goal. Okay, so here it is. What are you going to do Monday morning? Let's see, that's the question now. What are you going to do Monday morning? So here's what I say. Choose an area of human culture that you are comfortable with and passionate about. If it is in the area of education, great. Establish a flexible learning center, a homeschool academy, an apprenticeship program. If it is in the area of government or politics, great, fine. Get involved in the local political party, in the, in the Libertarian Party, and start jamming down their throat like my son does. Theonomy, Christian ethics. We don't see my son anymore. He lives with us, but we don't see him. <laughs> <laughs> It used to be when I was at conferences, they would meet my son and say, oh, you're Paul, you're Paul Michael Raymond's son. Well, now when we're at any political rally, they see me and say, oh, you're Christian Raymond's dad. <laughs> yeah. Get involved. You sacrifice your time and everything else. If your passion concerns the breakdown of the family, or foster care, or battered women, or teenage pregnancy, then go in that direction. I didn't have enough to do in my life, so I volunteered to become a CASA, C-A-S-A, a, a court-appointed special advocate for foster children who have been neglected, or abused, or battered. And what the, the strategy here is, we, we report directly to the judge. 
judge listens to the CASA, because the CASA and only the CASA knows what the child really needs. Social worker doesn't know, they've got 30 cases. CPS doesn't know, they just took the child away because the parents were either addicts or abusers or whatever. And we're able now to couch the argument from a biblical standpoint so that the best possible result will be given to this child from a biblical position. We are able to tell the judge that the Department of Social Services is too heavy handed in what they recommend for the child or the parent. We're able to tell the judge that psychotropic drug, drugs are not really needed. It's a behavioral problem, and it's actually a sin problem. Not that we would say that three-letter word, but that's what we would imply. And then we can recommend some of the alternatives. And that's power. And all because we inject ourselves into the culture in order to change the culture. It takes time, it takes sacrifice, it takes so many hours of your day. But sometimes when you figure out what you've got to do or what you want to do, is you're thinking, well, what can I do? Where do I fit in? Well, sometimes you have to think backwards. Sometimes in order to choose an area that you want to get involved in, you first might have to decide what you do not want to get involved in or where your efforts are not going to be placed because of your skills or your interests. And that narrows down your choices. Choose one area and create a plan. And whatever you can change, whatever you believe that you can change, change it. And whatever you believe that you cannot change, then leave it for somebody else. The body is one, but it's many. And someone else will take that place. Build a team of like-minded people. Many hands make light work. Use the Nehemiah principle. Associate yourself with only those people who have a mind to work. Keep reminding yourself of your ultimate goal. Go back to the why. Why do I want to do this? Why am I called to do this? Perhaps it's getting a biblically minded man into political office, or lobbying the city fathers to rethink their taxation policy, or opening up your home to a foster kid, or a battered woman, or a teenager who's had an unwanted pregnancy who decided not to abort their child. Build a network of these services among people that are passionate like you are. Create a concrete plan and execute it in real time by building concrete biblical alternatives. The culture moves closer to reflecting biblical truth. But only by building these concrete alternatives. Okay, one final word. And thank you so much for your patience. Get, please, get out of your comfort zone and get comfortable being uncomfortable. Get out of your comfort zone and get comfortable being uncomfortable. Learn to be creative. If you're not naturally creative, sometimes I hear people, well, I don't know, I, I'm not creative. Well, find somebody who is. What's wrong with you? <laughs> you have a phone book, you have a church directory, find somebody who is creative who could stimulate you. I don't want to hear anybody whining. Well, I don't know what to do. I'm not sure what to do this. Like, Wait a minute, what are we just talking about for the last hour and a half? So get comfortable being uncomfortable because everything that you do, when you walk into that unknown, it's very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But all you need to know is God is with you. Mm -hmm. So get comfortable being uncomfortable. Think big, but start small. Mm -hmm. They have small beginnings. Despise it not. But think big. God, God will, will reward you for the thinking big. Think big. You know, I remember, I mean, you probably, some of you, some of you won't know this. I'm sure my age, I guess. When, when that movie came out, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Jack Nicholson said, I'm going to get out of here. I don't belong here. And here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to take that sink and I'm going to rip it off the wall. Out of the concrete wall, I'm going to rip that sink off the wall and I'm going to throw it through that wall and I'm going to run out into the field and escape. And everybody laughed at him. Now he was thinking big. So he goes over to the sink and he strains himself and struggles and he's pulling and he's pulling and pulling and pulling and all the nuts in the, in the, in the, in the nut house there are laughing at him. 
He's determined, 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 determined. But he didn't understand at that time because he didn't get the sink off the wall. He couldn't do it. He wasn't strong enough. But he was providing an example of tenacity and resolve. So after they lobotomized him, one of the inmates, the six foot seven Indian chief, 320 pounds, goes over to that sink, grabs the sink, rips it off of the wall, throws it off into the other wall, destroying that wall, running through the hole, and escaping into the field into the night. Think big. Start small. Listen, watch, and learn from creative people. Read books that detail strategies and tactics for getting things done and funnel them through a biblical lens and make them theologically focused. Listen to instructional, tactical, and strategic podcasts. Not pontificators, mind you, but people that know how to get things done and who have done them. So, ask the advice of people that have actually accomplished something and stop listening to those keyboard jockeys that are like John Bunyan, Mr. Talkative in Pilgrim's Progress, who talk incessantly about things that they don't even know what they're talking about and who haven't really accomplished anything worthwhile. And for us, we need to talk less and listen more. Study the history of the church. Study what the Puritans did, what the Reformers did and see if that would work in your community. Tell it to your community, of course, but, but study what they've done, what worked, what didn't work. What did they do to reorient the culture God would? Seek out and engage in continual feedback from people who are engaged in the building of an explicitly biblical alternative to the culture. If you haven't got everybody's email at this conference yet, you need to get it before you leave. Start a group. Huh? on a Facebook group. Everybody else is. But at least you continue to make it concretely applicable. Write out your ideas. Keep a log. Keep a journal so that you can measure your success and your failure and your failures. Remember, what you, what you, you cannot master what you don't measure. And you've got to know where you failed. And then you can share it with someone else. Don't do it this way. And look, I could tell you what I did. That was the biggest mistake in the world. We moved to Virginia, and I've got a big head of steam. First thing I do, I write a letter to the civil magistrates of ripping their heads off, identifying all their problems. Well, you know, it took me years to get back to where I needed to be to be influential. We made a lot of mistakes. God knows I made a lot of mistakes. I'm still making mistakes. I'm inventing new ones as I go. It doesn't really matter. And most importantly, don't wait till you all, don't wait until you have all your ducks in a row. Ducks, they'll always break rank, and you'll think you have to start all over. And that's just another way to procrastinate. Permit me to end with this passage from the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter four. And I, Nehemiah, looked and rose up and said to the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. So built we the wall. All the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind is your mind a mind that longs to work? Are you prepared to step into the unknown like Moses and Joshua and like the other heroes of faith to become the man or the woman or the boy or the girl that God has called you to be? May God be pleased to give all of us that same mind to work the work of Him that sent us so that we might do this work, all of it, to the praise of the glory of His grace. All of God's people say it together. Amen. 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 Father in heaven, we are so grateful the men who have gone before us, for the men who are here today, and the men, and the women, and the boys and girls who will follow. Those who have a mind to work. 
the men here at Mars who have faced down the dragon, who have been slandered, who have been misjudged. We pray for them because we have had at this time in this part of history, according to thy providence, a great undertaking. We pray, our Father, that thou would give us the, the tenacity and the resolve that only God can give to each and every one of us. We stand ready to help one another in any undertakings that, that we seek to undertake for the glory of God and for the advancement of his kingdom. So that truly, truly one day, not, maybe not in our day, Maybe in our children's day, grandchildren's day. But knowing this, that one day, if we remain faithful, building those alternatives, that truly we will see the knowledge of the Lord cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And at that time, every knee will bow because it can do no other. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thank thee, and we ask thy blessing upon us. In the name of Christ, our prophet, our priest, and our king. Amen. Amen. And amen. Amen.